Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the National Archives in the William G. McGowan Theater this evening. Special welcome to our friends at C-SPAN and the other media outlets who are with us tonight. We have a lot of special guests in the audience today, but I want to single out for a special welcome Senator Mike Lee, who's a good friend of the National Archives, Senator Lee from Utah. who himself clerked for a future Supreme Court Justice, Judge Alito, when he was at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Welcome. On Monday, the Constitution of the United States turns 225. Tonight's program is one of the several that the National Archives is presenting this month in celebration of this founding document, signed in Philadelphia on September 17, 1787. Tonight, we're honored to welcome two distinguished guests to explore the past, present, and future of the United States Constitution. Our partners for tonight's program in honor of the, of, of the Constitution are the Federalist Society and the Constitutional Accountability Center. And thanks for the opportunity to collaborate with you this evening. While the Declaration of Independence was long heralded as the icon of our independence and nationhood, the Constitution did not get as much attention. Its prose is not as stirring as the Declaration's, and its four parchment pages to the Declaration's single sheet deter most casual readers. That lack of celebration, however, worked to its advantage. Over the years, the Declaration was exposed to sunlight, dust, and smoke, but the Constitution was never exhibited. <laughs> when you view both original documents upstairs in the rotunda, you immediately see the difference. The Declaration is faded to the point of illegibility, while the Constitution looks nearly as fresh as it did when the scribe Jacob Chalice presented it to the Continental Convention, Constitutional Convention. Celebrating Constitution Day on September 17th has been a long-standing tradition here at the National Archives. It was the one day of the year when all four pages of the document were displayed to the public. Since 2003, we've been able to display all four pages year-round in the new cases in the rotunda. But this year, we've added something special for the 225th anniversary. For the first time in the history of the National Archives, we will display the resolution of transmittal to the Continental Congress, sometimes referred to as the fifth page of the Constitution. This momentous document described how the Constitution would be ratified and put into action. You'll be able to see it starting on Friday, September 14th, and it will re remain out through Monday, Constitution Day, September 17th. On the morning of Constitution Day, the highlight event of our celebration takes place, a naturalization ceremony for 225 new citizens of the United States. Though the National Archives has hosted this ceremony for decades, it never ceases to impress as the prospective citizens vow to support and defend the Constitution in front of the actual document. We encourage you to return over the next several days for more discussions, films, and special events for the Constitution's birthday. On Monday, September 17th, at noon, from noon until 2, we do Happy Birthday, U.S. Constitution here in the theater. It's a special program in celebration of the signing of the Constitution, and the first 225 guests will join the Founding Fathers for cake after their performance in the McGowan Theater. And on Wednesday, September, September 19th at 7 p.m., the Constitution and the War of 1812, again here in the theater. This is the 2012 Claude Moore Lecture. Journalist Roger Mudd moderates a panel discussion on what, what so proudly we hailed messages and lessons from the War of 1812. Tonight, we're privileged to hear two distinguished guests discuss the past, present, and future of the United States Constitution. Akil Reed Amar is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law at both the college and the law school. He received both his BA and JD from Yale and served as an editor of the Yale Law Journal. After clerking for Stephen Breyer when he was judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, Professor Amar joined the faculty of Yale in 1985. Professor Amar is a co-editor of a leading constitutional law casebook 
processes of constitutional decision making and is the author of several other books, including The Constitution and Criminal Procedure, The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, America's Constitution, a biography, and most recently, America's Unwritten Constitution, The Precedents and Principles We Live By. The Honorable Clarence Thomas has served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States for nearly 21 years. He attended Conception Seminary and received an AB from the College of the, of the Holy Cross and a JD from Yale Law School. He served as an Assistant Attorney General of Missouri from 1974 to 1977, an attorney with the Monsanto Company from 77 to 79, and legislative assistant to Senator John Danforth from 1979 to 81. From 1981 to 82, he served as Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education and as Chairman of the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission from 1982 to 1990. He became a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in 1990. And President Bush nominated him as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and he took his seat on October 23rd, 1991. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justice Thomas and Professor Amar to the stage. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for that extraordinarily gracious, warm welcome. Thank you uh, 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 to the National Archives and to the staff for, for making um, this event possible. Thanks also, special thanks to the Federalist Society and to the Constitution Accountability Center. And, and thank you, Justice Thomas, for, for being with us today as we mark the 225th birthday, 225th anniversary of our Constitution. Um, and I guess I'd like to start our conversation, which seems fitting with those, the, with the words that the Constitution starts with. We, the people. Um, and how that, what that phrase means to you, how that phrase maybe has changed over time, thanks to amendments and, and other developments. So what do you mean, who, who we? You know, who is this we? When did, when did folks like you and me become part of this? This, this we. Well, you know, the, um, well, obviously it didn't, it wasn't perfect. Uh, that's an understatement. But you grow up in an environment, at least I was fortunate enough to, where we believed that it was perfectible. Uh, you know, it's very, I think, uh, pretty much it's, it's acceptable or maybe in vogue somewhat today to be so critical or almost invariably critical of, what, of the country and pointing out what's wrong. Uh, there are obviously things wrong. Uh, there were obviously things wrong when I grew up in Georgia, and that was pointed out. But there was always this underlying belief that we were entitled to be a full participant in we, the people. Um, that's the way we grew up. It was the way the nuns, who were all immigrants, uh, would explain it to us, that we were <coughs> entitled as citizens of this country to be full participants. Uh, there was never any doubt that we were inherently equal. It said so in the Declaration of Independence. Um, of course, there were times uh, later on that I, too, became quite cynical and would make glib remarks and reciting the uh, not-so-pleasant remarks and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance or say things that I think were <laughs> I'm glad there were not these cell phones that <laughs> people can YouTube you and it's around forever. But I was just upset about things. But I grew up in an environment with people around me who believed that this country could be better, that the framework for it was there in we the people. We used to memorize the preamble to the Constitution. I, was, I always think it's so fascinating to think of 
these black kids in the segregated school in Savannah reciting the preamble to the Constitution of the United States or standing out in the schoolyard uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance every day before school. Mm -hmm. What do we believe? I mean, everything so obviously in front of you is wrong. You can't go to the public library. You can't live in certain neighborhoods. You can't go to certain schools. But despite all of that, you lived in an environment of people who said it was still our birthright mm -hmm. to be included mm -hmm. and continue to push not only to change the laws, but to maintain that belief in our hearts. I think today we sort of think that the, all of the work is done with the laws. I think the heavy lifting for us was done in here uh, because the people who raised us believed it in here. And the nuns who taught us believed it in here. Um, you know, today I was um, just down at um, Louisiana State University. And if you go to the Southeast Conference, there's this tremendous enthusiasm about football. <laughs> I'm a diehard Nebraska fan myself, so I understand that enthusiasm. But can you imagine, when I grew up, that's the enthusiasm we had for a country that did not allow us to fully participate. And the th one of the birthrights that's been passed on, I still have it. I still believe that it's perfectible. And I think I resist the kind of attitude that it's all lost. It's, it's the same attitude I had then. It's, a, it's ours. It's ours to make the best of, to disagree about, to work with, to realize its imperfections, but to keep working with it. So when I think of we the people, there's a lot. I think of the exclusion, but the possibility and then the eventuality of the inclusion of you and me. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at no one cares that, what, 40 years ago, you and I would not be sitting here talking about the Constitution of the United States, states except to say we're excluded. Mm -hmm. So, and now it's hardly noticed. You know, well, except you're a Sterling professor of law, so they probably noticed that. <laughs> You've done okay for yourself, my friend. Uh, <laughs> I doubt. You know, it's, that's nice of you to say, but I, you know, I, I really look back, and I have to say it's the same people. You know, I've tried to say it over the years, and I think in this city, people that's dismissed as, well, you're being you know, a Pollyanna or something like that. But I still say it's all the people who never gave up and had every reason to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first in that line would be people like my grandparents, not the cynical people who know it all, but these unlettered people who never, ever quit, mm -hmm. who got up every day and believed, and believed that even if they didn't make it, those who came after them would. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though they self-sacrificed. They were self-sacrificing offerings for these two boys and for the generations to come afterwards. So, you know, I, I don't think I, you know, people say you haven't, I haven't done, I've done this or that. I, you know, I think you and I both have people who gave the last full measure for us in many, many ways, and I just, I can't really take too many bows for that. So there's so much there, and over the course of our conversation, I hope you mentioned the Declaration of Independence and the fullness of time you alluded you know, to Mr. Lincoln and the last full measure that the, the Gettysburg um, address. Um, you mentioned who was in and who wasn't in this we and how that's changed over time. I, mean, I just want to say a little bit about, because I agree with you, that it is a little easy to be cynical. There were exclusions, and we can't forget that. that we didn't mean everyone at the founding. But just to pick up on that, and then we'll, we'll segue towards some of the other things that you've talked about. Looking back, just so the rest of us, so we can all begin to appreciate how extraordinary this birthday is that we, we celebrate. So 225 years ago, um, 
uh, let's say, August 1787, self-government exists almost nowhere in the planet outside of the, the New World. Um, you have um, uh, a few sheep and goat herders in Switzerland. Um, you know, this is before there were Swiss banks. Um, and uh, Holland, the Netherlands, is a, in the process of losing self-government. England, yes, it has a, a House of Commons, but also has a House of Lords and a hereditary king. And, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and you look back from, so the vast multitude of the planet, no self-government in Russia, in China, in India, in Africa, most of Europe. Absolutist tyrant is sort of, uh, sits on the throne of France. You look back for the previous millennia, you have democracy, self government existing in a very few tiny little city states, Athens, and they flicker out because they, they can't defend themselves militarily. And even where democracy did exist, people who speak the same language, worship the same gods, um, same climate and, and, and culture over very small little areas. And then, as I said, they blinked out. That's all of world history. Very little democracy. And you look today, and democracy is across half the planet. I like our chances in the next century. And if you ask me what changed, what's the hinge of all of that, I think I would say those words, we the people. 225 years ago is the hinge of world history because for all its exclusions at the time, it was way better, more perfect than went before because for the first time ever in the history of the planet, an entire continent got to vote on how they and their posterity would be governed. And there were lots of exclusions you know, from our perspective, but we wouldn't exist you know, as a democratic country, as a democratic world, but for that. that I, I, I would say it's the hinge of all modern history, to be that before democracy almost nowhere, and then a project has begun. It's launched. It's not perfect. It's, it's better than what we had before, but not at all you know, as good as what we have now, because I think we, we have gotten better. I, I want to talk a little bit about how that process of, of getting better, but I'm with you, I'm not a cynic. I think that we the people do ordain and establish was pretty stunning, what we actually did. Um, let me actually pick up on another thing, just actually since we're on this and then we'll move forward in time. You wrote a, it's not just that we voted, and it was a pretty fair vote, and it was a vote that could be lost in a whole bunch of states, and in fact, it was, it, it was voted down in Rhode Island and vo voted down in North Carolina. It, was, it wasn't rigged. But you wrote a, a very interesting concurrence, I think quite a brilliant concurrence, frankly, in a case called Ohio versus McIntyre, where you actually talked about the breadth of free speech in, in this event. People could be for the Constitution or against it. No one was shut down. No one was put in prison. If they liked George Washington or they didn't like George Washington, an amazing amount even of anonymous speech, just, uh, just this proliferation, robust, wide open, uninhibited um, discourse up and down a continent for a year. That's the year who, that we mark today, this, this month, the beginning of that. So some thoughts on, on free speech and voting at that moment and as you look back. And then we'll work our way forward in time. Well, you know, I am probably, I don't have a lot of company with my views on McIntyre, an anonymous speech, but I mean, you think about it, 225 years ago, you had, a, you had the Articles of Confederation, you had a Congress that didn't work, it was not functioning. Oh. <laughs> that was inadvertent. <laughs> but you had, um, it was a very interesting convention that arguably wasn't quite what they were authorized to do. <laughs> um, you had uh, the resolution that's going to be on exhibit. It's kind of interestingly worded. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly throws the word unanimous in and uses it in an interesting way. Um, but you know, I mean, you think of the going to Washington and trying to get him to leave Mount Vernon, and he doesn't want to leave because he's finally back home. He'd been away over four years, mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to leave. And he goes to Philadelphia, and they do it. They come up with this document, what, four months? Mm -hmm. 
And now you have it. It's going to the Congress, and it's going to be sent to the people, too. To the people. To the people, Amazing. to ratify. Amazing. I think that, you know, I, when I read about it, I, I have to admit, I'm one of those. I'm totally a sucker, you know. I, I get chills about it because that's the beginning of the development of a place that allows you and me to be here yes. with all its warts. Yes. You know, it's sort of the way I feel about my hometown of Savannah. It's got a lot of problems, but it's my home. And that's the way I feel about the Constitution. It's got a lot of problems. I don't know if I could do any better, um, but it's ours. And we get a chance through this wonderful uh, opportunity that we have in different roles to make it all work, to try to understand it, to try to make the country work. You know, I, maybe a part of the thing that we could do with celebrating the birthday. I mean, would you have a constitution if everybody there was a cynic? Would you have the amendments to the constitution if Mason was more cynical than adamant? Mm -hmm. Would you have uh, the Declaration of Independence if Jefferson was a cynic rather than someone who actually believed in something? Okay. Would you have a constitution if Madison didn't care? I mean, if we just, all the negative stuff, you know, I have come to the point, and I tell my law clerks this, <clears throat> that I've been in the city doing these jobs now for half of my natural life. The only reasons to do them are the ideals now. It's all, it's just these are things you believe in, this Constitution, this country. I know that's not what you say in Washington, D.C. anymore. You're supposed to say there's some angle, there's some methodology you're pushing, there's originalism, there's textualism. There are all these useless peripheral debates other than just doing our jobs the best we can and trying to live up to our respective, so, oath, our respective oaths to make it all work. Just what you're talking about. You know, your book. That's what you're saying. You're saying you got the text, but you also have over here this unwritten part. It was all these things that are happening over here to make it all work. I know that's not me. <laughs> so two thoughts on, on, on that since you mentioned both the Declaration and the Bill of Rights. Again, just to sort of set the stage about why the Constitution is this thing, thing really worthy of our celebration, acknowledging that who wasn't part of the we. None of the ancient democracies that ever existed in the world, even if they had democratic constitutions, ever had a democratic constitution-making process. None of them were put to vote by the people themselves in Athens or Florence or pre-imperial Rome. In 1776, as great as the Declaration of Independence was, not put to a vote, not a lot of free speech, either you're for us or you're against us, and it's the middle of a war and we can't have this philosophical debate. Um, and the constitution is put to a vote in which in eight of the 13 states, property qualifications are lowered or eliminated compared to what they were before. And then a year-long conversation in which people say, you know, there's some problems here. In effect, it's crowdsourced. And, and, and we, the people, actually say, where are the rights? And we get this Bill of Rights because of that conversation. And even before there's the text of freedom of speech, there's the practice of freedom of speech. Five times the Bill of Rights uses the same phrase, the people, and the first, and the second, and the fourth, and the ninth, and the tenth amendments. And I think it's because it's coming from the people. So this process of correction that you are talking about that's more, more perfectible, I think is connected to the democratic idea. When you get people together and they are in the process, and you have to make sure that they're not cynical. You have to beat the anti-federalists because then there's no constitution if you don't prevail. But you've got to get them, to keep them on board, to keep them believing, you know, keep them part of the game. Maybe you'll win next time. And they do. We call that the Bill of Rights. To, to keep that conversation going so that you can actually perfect it, or make it at least, or at least make it better than it was the day before with the Bill of Rights. You know, I don't know whether they're anti-federalists. I mean, maybe they didn't quite believe that the national government should be given so given unfettered authority. Mm -hmm. 
maybe they were the people who were saying, we got to have a Bill of Rights. Yep. You got to temper exactly. this authority with protection for the individual. So I don't know whether I would just call them anti-federalists. Anti I think that they were people who um, certainly saw that they had these God-given rights or believed it, and they thought that this would be an intrusion upon it if you didn't have some limit. So think about it. Would you have had the Bill of Rights if you didn't have those you, that we would call anti-federalists? I, I doubt it. Well, okay. And, 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 that, and you are a fierce believer in independence of thought, in dissent, in, you know, not even George Washington and Ben Franklin might have had a complete monopoly on all wisdom, so it was useful that you had a George Mason critiquing it, yeah, that you had the... George Mason. I think George Mason seemed like a pretty stubborn guy. And the other thing was that he, you know, I think that he made it clear, he did not undermine the process. If you go back and you look at the last days of the convention, George Mason did not throw a monkey wrench into the works. Right. What he did is he made it clear. He didn't filibuster. It, he made it absolutely clear. He had his list of objections. He thought you needed a Bill of Rights. He'd been down this road before. He was not a politician. He had no idea. He, he, he was not into making a lot of friends and, and, and allies. He was going to argue his point, and then he was going to return to Gunston Hall. Mm -hmm. the, I happen to think that that was pretty effective. He wasn't against. Remember, he was very helpful in developing the Constitution he was. The, uh, with a strong national government, but he wanted to build this wall that to make it clear that that did not exist. In, in, in sort of uh, uh, contradiction or in opposition to these individual rights. So I think he was, you know, again, he wasn't cynical, mm -hmm. he wasn't an obstructionist, mm -hmm. but he was, I think, rightly adamant that these protections exist. And here's one way of putting that, and then maybe we'll start to move forward in time with, with your permission. Um, the people who oppose the Declaration of Independence you never hear from them again. They're basically cast politically into the, uh, um, uh, into the void. Um, the people who oppose the Constitution, who think it could be better still, we call them you know, anti-federalist, they become, they're not cast out. They become presidents of the United States, James Monroe. Vice presidents of the United States, Elbridge, Gary, George Clinton, justices on the Supreme Court, Samuel Chase. But so you so it's, it's extraordinary how they're kept in the process. But think about it. It continues to play out. It's the same debate. What are the limits? What are the limits? You know, I hear people today make it seem as though that when you talk about limits on the national government, that that's antithetical to the Constitution, the existence of a national government. It has been, it's embedded in the original argument. The argument was always about limits. It wasn't about, their, you know, you hear this kind of glib comment, oh, these people are trying to push us back to the Articles of Confederation. That's ludicrous. And that's, that really doesn't, that's unhelpful. The very man who pushed for these limits actually helped develop the Constitution. So the debate, when you move it forward, whether you look at, um, you look at um, um, McCulloch versus Maryland, you look at, it's always arguing about, you know, whether there should be a national bank. You're arguing about the same limitations. Mm -hmm. You can fast forward to the debate today. Those, that debate is embedded in the very formation of the country. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, from the time we adopted the Constitution, that debate existed. And that debate has continued. There was a civil war fought, not just over slavery, which, you know, and obviously, I think I'm on the right side winning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I have a personal interest in that. And there are lots of these things. But at the same time, you understand that there were some people still fighting that debate or fighting that, you know, engaged in that debate. And subsequent to that, even with the adoption of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment, you still have it. So we're still talking about what are the limits of the national government? What is the role of the national government? How do we protect individual rights and individual liberties, et cetera? So let's actually move forward in time and start talking about the, 
the events that, that uh, presage the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, and I'd want our audience, you and I of course know this, but I want everyone out there um, on uh, C-SPAN to recognize that this month isn't just, it's a very special anniversary, it's not just the 225th anniversary of birthday of, uh, really I think the year that changes everything, the hinge of human history, this we the people uh, moment. It's also the 150th anniversary to, to the month of the first emancip uh, uh, initial Emancipation Proclamation, um, which is I issued on uh, uh, right immediately after the Battle of Antietam, um, which is fought September 17th, uh, 1862, 75 years to the, to the day um, uh, uh, after the Constitution ha has gone public. So we mark today not just the 220, this month, not just the 225th anniversary of the Constitution, but the, the sesquicentennial is I think what they, they call it, of, of the Emancipation Proclamation, a document you'll also find um, here in this building. I'll have a little bit more to say about that at the end. So we've been talking about some of our forebears, our you know, founding fathers. I guess some thoughts about our refounding, about of Father Abraham, about, we mentioned Washington, maybe bringing Lincoln into the picture too, and, and your thoughts about this a new birth of freedom that begins with uh, the emancipation. You have a family story. Um, your, you know, your grandfather, you write this book, My, My Grandfather's Son, and you mention that his grandmother was a freed slave, and so some thoughts about that. Well, you know, for us in the South, uh, Abe Lincoln was a great emancipator. Uh, I know there's revisionism today. I'm a big Abe Lincoln fan. I have a bust of Lincoln. I have photos of Lincoln. Um, I am not, I, you know, I have a problem with clothing everything in this sort of cynical revisionism. Um, Abe Lincoln meant quite a bit to us. You know, you go and you, I read his house divided speech, and you begin to see what the, what the country is. It's like the beginning. Once again, it's ripped asunder. You've got the, the, the South uh, is one way of life, and that, uh, again, with uh, the, the peculiar institution that, in my opinion, is the great, single greatest immorality in the country. How can you have a free country with slaves? We understood that. It's a contradiction. It contradicts the very founding premise of the country. But at any rate, Lincoln, for us, um, and when I grew up, was the he was the author of Real Liberty. Uh, you had the Emancipation Proclamation. You had Field Order Number 15. Tell, but, us, tell us what that is. Well, it was you the have order, to remind me of it. Well, it's backstage. issued. It, that was the <coughs> actual order that freed the slaves um, in the eastern part of coastal Georgia, I think down as far as Florida. And of course, my family was on an island, Asaba Island, and plantations along the coast of Georgia. Uh, for over a hundred years, the the our, we're from an island uh, again. It's just south of Hilton Head and Defusky in the Carolinas, and we are those Gullahs and Geechees. And the family would remain on that island even after the Civil War. Uh, it was a storm, actually, a hurricane in the 1890s that drove them uh, over toward Pinpoint and some of the the, the more in, uh, mainland um, uh, areas. But the, the fascinating thing is that the people who came from that not only maintained their culture, but there was always this desire to be a part of this country. And Lincoln was the person, the promise of 40 acres and a mule, et cetera. And that promise went on for years. Again, it was unfulfilled. But there was that promise. And it was a promise of freedom. It was a promise of the 40 acres and a mule. And so you would hear people talk about the lack of freedom in the same way that they talk about the unfulfilled promise of the 40 acres and a mule. But it was field order number 15 that directly affected my forebears. And so it has a very special place in my heart. And certainly, I keep in my office a copy of field order number 15 uh, and a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, because I, of course, have a very particular, I keep, actually, it's mounted on my wall. Um, because of my particular interest in what in it and what it has done for those who came before me. We are from a plantation, or part of my family is from a plantation south of Savannah. 
my grandfather was raised, and that's where we farm, just across from the plantation, where his grandmother had land. And his great-grandfather bought land uh, in the 1870s, right after he was freed. And we all, as my grandfather said, we all were going to be raised on, in the ways of slavery time. And that's the way we were raised on that farm. Uh, it's a very hard life, but it is a life uh, in a way of life of which I am enormously proud. Uh, the, uh, there's not been a moment in my life when I've had nothing but the greatest pride in the people who grew up under the most difficult circumstances with a dignity that's unmatched in this city and any of the great cities in this country. It's almost as though it is a nobility of humanity simply because of the dignity with which they bore the the, the, the negatives that were put in their way and the harshness of life. And as I say in my book, and I mean it, it my grandfather still reigns as the greatest person I know of or I know about. Um, you tell me a person who could have accepted and, and uh, not have a father, uh, uh, lose a mother, is, as he said, handed from pillar to post to relatives, his grandmother and uncle, and bore no education, and yet segregation, Jim Crow laws, and bore no bitterness. Rose above it and insisted that his grandsons rise above it. Fight it, um, participate, eliminate the wrongs, but not be consumed by it or destroyed by it. And I don't think how you could get much greater than that. Now, you and I are huge <coughs> Lincoln men. Mm -hmm. Do you think at all in the culture that Lincoln still gets his due? Because, we, you know, in so many ways, there's so much talk about the Founding Fathers, and yet you said the House divided speech. That house fell, in a way, because of the contradiction, because of slavery. And, and Lincoln's generation rebuilds it. Frederick Douglass and others. Do we give that maybe, you know, that, that has a claim to be the greatest generation too. Do we today, in our law, in our culture, give enough credit to that uh, um, uh, refounding? You know, you think of the great moments in our history. We talk about, of course, the revolution, the, certainly the Constitution, what we celebrate now. 225 years, but it was all coming asunder. It was coming apart. And the country as we know it today is reshaped after the Civil War, the Civil War amendments. I mean, you teach in the area of uh, constitutional law. You're an expert. What would it look like if there were no 14th Amendment now? What would be its application, the Bill of Rights, to states? Exactly. Um, so there's a whole, there is so much that goes beyond the war. You know, and I tell my law clerks, that's why we have to go to Gettysburg. This isn't just about, you know, we, we pull these little threads out of what we do every day. We talk about textualism and originalism and we argue over that. It is much bigger than that. You know, I see some people here who argue before the court. I not once thought that the people who came there did not understand that what we did was larger than who we are. That we were engaged in an enterprise to preserve something that is truly great. Do we agree? No more than the framers agreed. No more than Mason and Hamilton agreed. But do we say they did not want it to work? No. No, that's the beauty of we the people. We the people agree that we should have a country exactly what it should be. We disagree. Not so to the point that we destroy it, but certainly to the point that we think that we're perfecting it. And we're still here. Mm -hmm. So, no, I think that Lincoln saw what was happening with the Civil War. He saw that slavery we could not exist half slave and half free. That you couldn't do it. It was not going to happen. He understood that, that you had to have a union. 
And he knew ultimately it could not be a slave country, country that allowed slavery. Now, I know you have your revisionists and people quibble. I, I, you know, I just, I don't have time to pick all those lints out of it, that lint out of everything. I, Lincoln uh, uh, preserved the Union. Uh, Frederick Douglass, you mentioned. I also have a portrait of him behind my desk. He's been there. I've had that portrait since I went on the court two decades ago, a little more than two decades ago. I'm a big fan of Frederick Douglass. I want you to think of what courage it took for him, a freed slave, to stand as he stood, to cite the Declaration of Independence, not something that's foreign to this nation, but the founding document of this nation. He cited that as Exhibit A in what was wrong with slavery. Exhibit A. You didn't need to go to another, any other shores or any other ideology. It was our founding ideology. How could you be inherently equal and have slaves? How can you be free and enslave another race? He understood that. So we fought a great war. You go to Gettysburg. And what does he say? It's up to us, the living, to make it all worthwhile. We're the living. We're the living. We have an opportunity, a finite amount of time, to make it work. So I hear people, they just, you know, the, that you disagree with someone. Well, that person's motives must be bad. Well, that's not the case. I don't think that, that Mason's motives were bad. He was not necessarily a cheery fellow, <laughs> you know? You could probably say that, you know, he's a dour man who's always upset about something. You know, he's too bilious for me or something. But he contributed. Washington, Washington did not want to go. You know, Hamilton. You know, he was young, you know, those guys, maybe he wanted to make money, I don't know. But he contributed. And so I think that we should sort of look at this more in the way that not warring factions like the Civil War, but rather as people who are engaged in this great project as Lincoln, as Lincoln sort of left us at Gettysburg. We the living. Mm -hmm. And we, we may be disagreeing as the living, but we the living. And that's one of the things I do like about the court. I've been there now through a number of members of the court. And in the years I've been there, I honestly come away thinking that every member really wants to make it work. They really, every single member, I, you don't, they don't agree with each other. But somehow they agree that this is more important than we are, and we've got to make this thing work. So, yes, I'm a Lincoln person. I am a Frederick Douglass person. I am a Booker T. Washington person. I grew up loving these people, and I will go to my grave. I think that I want you to, one last point. I want you to think of a little black kid in Savannah, Georgia, in the Carnegie Library. Mm -hmm. And you see pictures of whom? The great emancipator, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Washington. You see what I'm saying? You grow up that this is a part of your life. This is a part of your fabric. This is the underpinning. And what do you think you bring to the court if that's the way you're raised? You bring this sense that it's not some ambition, it's this obligation to fulfill something that they started. It's this calling you have to do what you're supposed to do. Is it hard? Sometimes. Is it disagreeable? Well, sometimes. But is it the right thing? Yes, all the time. And I'm willing to bet you if we could get Lincoln to come back and we could ask him how hard the Civil War was and how hard being president was, whether or not he would say to you it was worth it. And I'm willing to bet you he would. If you were to ask Washington to come back and ask him whether it was worth leaving family to fight at Valley Forge in the Revolution, he would say it was worth it to leave Mount Vernon to go to the Constitutional Convention 
He would say it was worth it to leave to become president. He would say it was worth it. All the, the absentees, all the days, I think they would say it. And I think any of us should be able to say that. So, no, I'm a Lincoln person. I am a, uh, a Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass. Um, and I keep those around me to remind me of what our obligations are, yours and mine. Now, the first time I think I heard you, uh, you were talking about the Declaration of Independence, um, which, of course, Mr. Lincoln alludes to right out of the gate uh, in the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven, well, that's 1863 minus in 87. That's 1776 when you do the math. Mm -hmm. Now, our fathers, again, this imagery, you know, uh, uh, and then he quotes from the Declaration. Um, uh, uh, our fathers brought forth in you know, a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That's the language from the Declaration. You have often, you have thoughts about the Declaration. It's, it's up there um, in the rotunda alongside the Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation and, and the Parchment Constitution itself. So I just wanted to invite you to, to as you have talked about Lincoln, to, to tell us a little bit about how you think about the Declaration and, and its part in the American story. You know, you, you think it, the beginning is that we have these rights. We're endowed with certain unalienable rights. And we give up some of those rights to be governed by consent. That's critical. For me, when I started, though, it wasn't so much about the government. It was about what was the best argument against slavery. It was as simple as that. When you grow up under segregation, you take the founding document and you use it as the point to make to others who think that segregation is right. This is our founding document and we are inherently equals. The nuns ingrained it in us. The declaration and our faith in God we were created equal. And they didn't have to go to the, the Bible or a religious document. They went to the founding document, mm -hmm. that we are created equal. That was always the thing you carried with you when you were treated badly, when people try to ingrain, ingrain it. And you know I hear people say it affected your self-esteem to be segregated. It never affected mine. Mm -hmm. And absolutely at no point in my life, because from day one, we knew we were equal. It said so. The nun said so. My grandfather said so. And by golly, the Declaration of Independence said so. And it may have taken a war, and it may take black codes and slave codes and Jim Crow laws. But still, no matter how contradictory that was, here was this document that said we were equal. So it starts there. Then you look, you, that's what got me started again at EEOC, to read this great document, to reread it, to talk about it, to talk about the founding. I wasn't going to be a judge. I, who knows how I became a judge, you know? I was at EEOC. I was only interested in the best about this country with all its problems, the things that made it worth having. And the lo and behold, you come to the understanding that this founding document, this great experiment, is a wonderful thing. And that was in the mid-1980s. I was chairman at EEOC, worrying more about budgets and getting in all sorts of trouble over the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and this hearing and that hearing, none of which was of great consequence as far as the, the, the structure of the country. But spending hour after hour learning about it, things that you write about so and teach so eloquently. Um, I think that, um, the, for me, that central document is the greatest. I think that, that one, the Declaration of Independence, and to then go to Gettysburg and to think about Pickett's Charge, to think about the carnage there, the lives lost, the, the great battles before at Fredericksburg and at the Wilderness and Chancellorville, 
you talk about Antietam, you talk about uh, Shiloh and Manassas, all these battles for people defending or either what they think a way of life or slavery, what happened, all of it, all that bloodshed to settle this, this contradiction. Mm -hmm. And we won. We have our country. And I like to go to Gettysburg to say to my clerks, are we, do we deserve this? Do we deserve this sacrifice for a country that we have? And are we living up to that? Are we doing our part? You know, you just go any place. Think of the people at Battle of the Bulge, or you think of them at, um, you know, during um, any war. And just ask yourself, you know, they've, let's assume without debating whether you should have had this battle or this war or that. They've done their part, have we done ours? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I was told, uh, I was gonna be a priest. That's the only real sort of goal that I had. And what's a priest? You're called to do something. Every, every ex-seminarian is always looking for that next vocation. Suppose your call now is to do your part. To see, to, to, to be able to, to earn the right to be here. You mention in your book very promptly on the first page, on the last page, you just uh, mentioned again God. Um, the Declaration of Independence has a very prominent, um, several prominent, from the very beginning, nature and nature is God, you know, endowed by our Creator. Um, at the very end, in the most uh, military language, uh, um, uh, appealing to um, uh, the supreme judge of the world um, for the rectitude of our intentions. And they're not talking about Robert C.J. They're, 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 they're um, uh, great as he is. Um, um, uh, 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 now, um, thoughts, and then you look at the Constitution, and the references aren't so prominent. Um, uh, Janie Randall um, has talked about, uh, one of our, uh, um, uh, my students wrote an interesting paper about the words Sundays accepted in the Constitution, but it's, it's not very prominent in, in the preamble or um, um, in other articles. We've just this week heard debates or conversations about God on the coins, um, whether there were sufficient references to to God um, on 9-11. So, so thoughts about um, the, uh, the role of, of references to God in um, our national discourse, in our, our, our public culture. Well, I think we're um, kidding ourselves if we don't think it's been prominent and a central part of our formation. I mean, you can argue nihilism or atheism now, but you, I mean, we know it's there. Um, so, I mean, you first, Amendment is what? Congress shall make no, war, no law respecting the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. In other words, stay out of it and leave people alone when it comes to their religion. Obviously, it assumes there's, a, there's the religion, mm -hmm. okay, and there's God. I mean, we knew what the religions were. The Baptist Convention, they weren't like uh, worshiping a pulpit or something. They're God. They believe in God. So I, you know, I, I'm not going to revise history to pretend that. I grew up in a religious environment, and I'm proud of it. I was going to be a priest. I'm proud of it. And I thank God I believed in God, or I would probably be enormously angry right now. Okay. So the, the, I am grateful for my faith and uh, unapologetic about it. So. Now here's one interesting sort of, um, uh, I mean, it is pretty remarkable. We started talking a little bit about how the we has changed over time. We could have also added the 19th Amendment and, um, and women becoming part of this ever grading, greater arc of, of, of democratic inclusion. Amendments. You also add prohibition. So. Which got, you know. Well, uh, yeah, you drink to that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, and that was repealed. Yeah. But, yeah, but in, but in general, most that. of the amendments really have made, the, it, it, this is what you said before, sort of made the thing, I think, more perfect. Um, well, that um, made it less perfect, uh, I guess. But, but then it got, we got rid of it, so... Oh, I don't drink, but yeah. I understand, you know. 
<laughs> but on religion, it is pretty extraordinary. Um, the Constitution frees every um, American to be eligible for public office. Um, there's no religious test oath. Um, and that wasn't a prominent feature of the state constitutions. A lot of them actually had religious tests. Well, you for had actually holding. in New England in particular. I mean, you had establishment religions. Yeah. So I understand that, but I'm just simply saying that the country moved on. I grew up at a time when people were respectful of religion and, and religious people. I grew up when the church was open all the time and nobody broke in, uh, and, and, and that uh, nobody uh, 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 engaged in sacrilegious conduct in the church. It was just our church. It was in the inner city. I walked to 6 o'clock mass to, to be the altar boy there, and I was a little guy with my U.S. Uh, government surplus back book bag and uh, I'm scared of dogs more than anything else. <laughs> but the, you know, I, I really like what I grew up. I can't transpose that or superimpose it, or uh, transpose it to or superimpose it on the current day. But I think our country is what it is. And there's some of us who but for faith would not be here. Mm -hmm. There was nothing in front of me to tell me it was okay to keep trying. There was nothing in front of me that explained all the wrong, the, the hurt, the pain, the, 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 the things that happened, even in this city to me. There was nothing that could deal with it. Mm -hmm. And to make you a better person, to force you to be a good person, when everything around you says you could be like mean and cynical and react and punch back, you know? So yeah, I mean, I. I know all the smart Alex, they know better than I do, but they weren't there. They weren't in the tenements, they weren't in the heat, they, weren't, they didn't walk in those steps. And I thank God for the environment I was in of people who had strong faith, the house I was in of people of strong faith, uh, the schools I went to. Mm -hmm. Did we impose it on anyone else? No, mm -hmm. it was ours. And uh, I certainly, in my own daily life, I respect other people. I don't abuse them. I don't do things to them. You respect them. And that all comes from the way I was raised. And that includes a strong faith. And this thought that, that I had, um, which is, I, I think we've, as Americans today, grown into a pretty remarkably respectful um, uh, of a faith culture in the following sense. We begin by saying, the, the system is open to people of many different faiths. We're not going to require a belief in the Trinity or you know, in any particular doc. So here's what, what actually just strikes me at this moment as we sort of look back 225 years later just at the, at the process that's developed. Ours remains a kind of, theirs was a project um, uh, where most Americans at the founding were mainstream Protestants. Um, Mainstream Protestantism today sort of remains a huge part of our culture, and yet here's what's interesting. None of the justices, I think, on the court is a mainstream Protestant, neither... Um, you have to ask them. Yeah. I don't speak for them. But, but neither um, John Boehner <laughs> nor Harry Reid. Um, I have no idea. None of the, of the, of the four presidential <laughs> candidates um, um, only you spend Barack, a lot of time following only this stuff. But <laughs> is only Barack Obama, whose father was a mother. It's, you know, what I'm saying is it's, a, it's an extraordinary openness, actually, 225 you know, I, years later. I think we talk about it a lot. I, you know, I liked it when I was a kid. You didn't talk about it a whole lot. You just lived your life. Mm -hmm. That, to me, we talk a lot about, you know, <laughs> this person is that, that person's this, and then we all pretend that we're all tolerant. You know, I liked it when people didn't care. Like, just a, you, you, I was Catholic. I mean, you, you talk about a minority within a minority within a minority. I was a black Catholic in Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> now that is a, what is an insular, what is it? Discrete an, and insular, an insular minority. minority. That's us, a discreet and insular minority. So, the, I, but nobody bothered us. I was the only black kid in my seminary, 1965. 64, there was another young man, he left. And so the next two years, I was there by myself, in Savannah. I, nobody bothered me. 
So I hear people say these things about they're tolerant, but they're really pointing, they're really identifying who's what a lot more. The, um, I kind of like the idea that when you started, here you and I are here. Neither one of us is Caucasian. And nobody seems to care. Nobody's pointing it out. Well, we noticed it. Said, oh, you look like you're Indian descent. Oh, you look like you're, well, I don't know what they say. People say horrible things about me. They said, well, I'm not black. So I'm just uh, a little doubtful I should say I'm black, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, here we are. No one really is bringing that point up. I think what you should be more concerned about, particularly at the court, is look where we are. We're all from the Ivy Leagues. That, that seems to be more relevant than what faith people are. Mm -hmm. But even with that, even with we can nitpick all that, these are good people. These are people who, I go back to what I said, they are continuing what was started mm -hmm. 200 years ago with that debate about the great document. Mm -hmm. They're good people. I mean, I sit next to uh, Justice Ginsburg. Now, how often do we agree? <laughs> a lot, actually. We do? Yeah. I mean, in most, uh, I mean, <laughs> mo you know, most, of, many cases are unanimous. You, you, you know, oh, the you, unanimous yeah. cases, yes. yes. <laughs> well, that's given me a lot. And the una I agree with her in all the unanimous cases. <laughs> you know, I like that. That's really a shrewd move. Well, there's one category of cases we agree. What are they? The unanimous cases. <laughs> but, but she is a good person. And she is a fabulous judge. I like sitting next to her. You know, we're friends. So, but the, I think that's what you want. You want people who still believe, who will work together and try to get it right, but don't change their mind just because they're there, just because it's sort of the fad. You want them to think. The same way you had it at the convention, in the we the people, the ratification debates. I, mean, I think I would love to, I'm gonna spend time going back to read them, simply because that was a time, you talk about people actually saying what they believe, mm -hmm. people actually fighting about it, people actually caring about it, people writing articles about it, the Federalist Papers, people traveling, people having meetings at homes and, in their churches, oh, you can't do that, I guess. But you having people meeting in their um, uh, uh, in, in in town halls, all over the country, debating them. People actually, and this is a fascinating thing: people who actually read the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that's new. People claim to love it today. Do they actually read it? They read it back then, mm -hmm. and they were not as universally available. There was no internet to read it on. But they, they somehow printed them and read them and mm -hmm. talked about them. Absolutely. And the people who couldn't read had it read to them mm -hmm. and formed opinions. So I think, yes, it was a, I think it was um, a debate about this country, its formation, how it would develop, in what direction, the protections. And I think it continues. It's the same debate. So you can talk about the Commerce Clause. You can talk about equal protection or due process, substantive due process, the First Amendment. It's all the same debate. And it is an appropriate debate. And it's one that I would wish would sort of try to reach the same high level that we saw in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And that we're going to see at other points in the ratification process. Who writes like the, the sort of defenses and arguments that you see in the Federalists today? Who writes them? Who sits at home and drafts the arguments that you see, letters? Like you see Mason. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a staff drafting these things. Mm -hmm. These are people who were engaged, who knew the Constitution. And the, also want you to know, these were not scholars. These were not people who had appropriated to themselves license, the sole license to interpret or to talk about this great document. These were farmers. These were business people. Some of them who had formal education, some who did not. But they cared about this country. And it's, I think we still have it today. 
And, you know, I, I think that, uh, again, I go back to your book. You talk about the written and the unwritten Constitution. Well, the unwritten Constitution is really what we do. It's that sort of trying to uh, bring, to apply it to mm -hmm. current ha events and problems mm -hmm. and cases mm -hmm. and develop it. Mm -hmm. And that debate continues on each one of those. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see the court take different points of view. That's why the arguments are so important. That's why your scholarship is so important. And you know, one thing I like about the tone of your book is the po it's so positive. It's refreshing. You know, it's not I have all the answers, but here are some answers. Let's talk about it. Okay. It isn't up here. You know, I tell my clerks when we work on opinions, you got to explain this. Take your parents. They're immigrants. They're, re they're bright people, but I don't think they're doctors, mm -hmm. not lawyers. Exactly. They, it's their constitution, too. Right. And we should explain it and get in a way and interpret it in a way to make it accessible to them. And that's what I think you're trying to do with your book, to make it accessible, to open it up. So here's maybe one concluding um, note. Um, uh, so we've been talking a lot about the past, last 225 years, this sort of arc of ever greater inclusion. We didn't talk as much as we might have about woman suffrage, but that, of course, is a, a huge, I yeah. mean, revolutionary. Um, um, a, 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 a moment of, of additional inclusion. These, these amendments that prohibition uh, aside generally tend to expand liberty and equality, which is pretty striking that, that in general the amendments do that and they don't take us back. Um, uh, now here's the, the, the thought experiment because one understanding of an unwritten constitution might be the Constitution still to be written, the unfinished Constitution. What, we're not done, history isn't over. Um, what amendments are imaginable over the next 225 years? If we look back. I hope you don't expect me to hang around. <laughs> <laughs> well, just thinking about, you know, if, if we, because you and I spent a lot of our time thinking about 225 years ago, 150 years ago, 75 years ago. Um, if we turn that camera around and try to think forward, 75 years from now, 150 years from now, 225 years from now, any thoughts at all? These issues aren't going to come up before the court immediately, but just on, so I, you know, just thoughts on the democratic project in America or the world, you know, going forward. You know, I. I'm not that creative or that prescient. Um, you know, I do think, I, I wonder when people look back as we're looking back now, will they say we added something? Mm -hmm. um, will they look at what we've written and understand that um, we actually thought about things or we were just trying to score a point here or there? Mm -hmm. I would hope that we can say that we've made, uh, or at least they can say we've made a positive contribution, as positive as you and I think of the, those who were at the convention, those who participated in the debate. Um, they added something. Um, you know, when we do opinions, I, I don't like to get into this back and forth with my colleagues and quibble with them. Um, I like at the end of it to say this is what I think we should be looking at or we approach that we should be taking. And that doesn't mean everybody should agree with me or they should uh, change their minds. I just think that what you're trying to do is think it through and tell them exactly what you think without rancor or without um, personal attacks, ad hominems, there's enough of that. Um, but just to try to add something. So I think that we are obligated, you and me. Yes. If we talk about this great document, we're obligated to try to improve it. Yes. We're obligated to disagree, but in a way that's constructive, in a way that adds something, in a way that is worthy of the Constitution. We think it's a document up here. And I think we are obligated. You have kids. 
you teach them that they talk about things in a certain way and to each other in a certain way, to their parents in a certain way, to your parents in a respectful way. This is a great document. And, and you know, I don't, I don't deny the flaws. I really don't. I've lived the flaws. <laughs> I've lived the contradictions. I say it in spite of that, that it is to us to the do living. the positive. It's you and I, the living. The living. It's up, that's what Lincoln is. But it's, it's you and I. Yeah. We're talking about it. I have a job. I start again uh, this month to go back to that job to, that we're called to do. You and I have an obligation to do it in a positive way, that I had something. And what I don't want is to someone to say, well, you know, he was there, but he was cynical or negative and didn't think it through. Uh, that I remember, notice, I didn't say, I want them to say, I agree with you. I couldn't care less. That's not my point. The point is, do you think it through and communicate it in a way that adds to this development that you're talking about? Think about Harlan. Think about Harlan and Plessy. The first Justice John Marshall Harlan. Harlan. The great dissenter, the, Plessy versus Ferguson. Do we quote from the majority opinion or the dissent? Exactly. It's the dissent that won the day. Sixty years later, it was the dissent. So you write it in a way that contributes. Did you think when he was the lone dissenter? Alone in dissent. That, do you think? Sole dissenter. And as I understand, as I, if I, my recollection serves me, the sole southerner on the court. From Kentucky. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. But these are little tidbits that, as, as uh, I think sometimes, as my wife says, that I get too caught up in all these little things. Because you read these cases over and over and over, and just the eloquence of it. That, you know, that, Think of what he said. That, you know, you, we have all our biases and people, and and and, but this document, this is what he says. This document knows no caste <laughs> and knows no color. This document. It's colorblind. Well, the Constitution. He didn't quite say that. He said it knows no color. Yes, it knows no color. And I truly believe that he added something. And at that time. He was alone, that people thought that they could deal with us in a constitutional way based on our skin color. I've lived that. That's a contradiction. What do you think we held on to? The majority opinion? Are those words from Justice Harlan? It is my understanding that that dissent was what uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall read when he was despondent and thought that he was having great difficulty in doing the right thing across this country. He would read that dissent, but we both read it at different points. He a great man and me a little kid, an aspirin, a giant, and a kid merely trying to get out of it. And you now sit in the seat that Thurgood Marshall uh, I sit in a chair. I think he occupied his own seat. <laughs> um, the thing that, you know, I had spent time with him, and I'd like to just say a word. People do a lot of talking on behalf of other people. I sat with him in a meeting when I first got to the court, a, a courtesy visit that was supposed to last 10 minutes and lasted two and a half hours. And he regaled me with stories. Um, and I said to him, I wish that if I'd had the courage and the age that I could have traveled with him across the South but I doubt I would have had the courage that he had to do that. And he looked at me and very quietly said, I have to do in my time what I have to do. You have to do in your time what you have to do. That was all the guidance. Hmm. And perhaps when we talk about this great document, it sums up the founders. It sums up those at the convention. They had to do in their time what they had to do. And they did it. And we have to do in our time what we have to do. Will we do it? So um, with that, let me add one additional thought and, and then maybe bring our proceedings to a, a close. Um, this conversation, um, 
I think has been in, in the spirit that you're calling for. Um, our um, sponsoring institutions, the Federalist Society and the Constitutional Accountability Center, they don't always agree on everything, but I think they both do agree on the idea of, of serious conversation um, centered on, on this document. Um, uh, since I mentioned <coughs> amendments, I, and I'm not going to make too many predictions, but I will say that most of the amendments, um, as, a, as a practical matter, had to have the support of both parties because it's hard to get two thirds, two thirds, three quarters mm -hmm. without both parties being on board. The great amendments of the 1960s, for example, the great iconic statutes of the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the um, Fair Housing Act of, of, of 68, Republicans and Democrats in the spirit that you're calling for. And, and I have one other thought since we're talking about our, um, our sponsoring institutions for this really extraordinary conversation. Um, and that's the, the National Archives. I, I think that the framers of the Constitution who were amending their regime studied what had gone before. They studied the state constitution, see, saw which ones worked and didn't. They, Massachusetts put its constitution to a vote, so let's put our constitution to a vote. Um, most of the constitutions have three branches of government, let's go with that. Most of them have bicameralism, let's go with that. Um, an independent executive works well for Massachusetts and New York, let's build on, on that and so on. The abolition of slavery and, and the amendments, many of the Bill of Rights, George Mason you mentioned. He first gives us Virginia's Bill of Rights and that's a model for the Federal Bill of Rights. Abolition of slavery occurred in various states and then at a federal level. So, so um, we have to study you know, and make amends what has gone before us. We have this duty to the future, but I think we discharge it best when we actually are understanding or respectful of the past and that's part of what the, this National Archives is about. And if I could just, um, uh, on a personal note, tell you the story of why I'm here. You see, I mean, Justice Thomas's uh, presence needs no um, explanation. He's, he's Justice Thomas, but what the heck am I doing here? Well, um, uh, <coughs> when I was 11 years old, I came to the National Archives, um, and I got this document. It's a big, big version of the Emancipation Proclamation, um, and um, it was uh, uh, an an edition of the Emancipation Proclamation. You can take a look on the, the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation 50 years ago was uh, September 1962 and, and, uh, and the archives um, uh, released that uh, um, uh, um, a special edition for, for kids like me and I got my picture of Abe Lincoln because I'm, <laughs> I'm a Lincoln man too. You don't throw anything uh, out. I don't. I, it's me. So the, um, and, um, and I came, and that's what made me not cynical. Coming at a very young age to a place like this, being exposed to Mr. Lincoln and what he did um, for the Union, being exposed to the Declaration of Independence of the Constitution. Um, and I think I'm here today, honestly, because of that. And, and so I would like to give special thanks for this national treasure, the National Archives. I'd, I want to thank all of you for coming to this um, extraordinary conversation. I want to encourage those in the, on the television audience to come to this place if you can. Bring your kids. Bring your grandkids and your grandnephew. Bring the next generation uh, here. And, and if you can't come here physically, experience the National Archives online. You mentioned the internet. Because um, I think <coughs> and if it is up to us, the living, we, we can't just think about the future without thinking very deeply about the past. And I think this is a place that will help us do that thinking. And, and so I, I ask all of you to join me in thanking Justice Thomas and thanking the archives. Thank you. All.